We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677 and a person from our team will respond and we will help you move forward together. Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey and we wanna help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677 and a person from our team will respond and we will help you move forward together.
Hey everyone, my name is Zach. And I'm Sean. And we are so glad you came out to join us this weekend. We know there are a lot of things you could be doing on your weekend, and the fact that you chose to spend an hour of your time with us means the world to us. Now listen, if you're new, we'd love to share real quick what's gonna happen today so you can know what to expect. All in all, we're going to be here for just over an hour. We're gonna start by singing together. We love to worship together loudly at Vail. So go ahead, turn your speakers up, and follow along with the words in the bottom corner. After that, we're gonna learn about what is happening in the life of Vail, and then hear a great encouraging message. After the message, to end the service, we will all sing together again. Throughout the service, we will have the chat feed open for you to share your thoughts with others who are watching around the world. We are excited for all God is doing here at Vail. We believe that watching Vail online, it's a great first step. As you check us out today, I would love to invite you and encourage you to come and join us in person at one of our upcoming weekend experiences. Our service times are shown below. You, your family, and your friends will have plenty of space with full programming from birth to adults. Vail is consistently growing and expanding to bring more people into the church. And we believe in community and would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here at Vail. We hope to see you in person soon. Well, this service is about to begin, so open up our Veiled Church app, sit back on your couch, hit that full screen button as we go ahead and jump into the service. Welcome to Vail. Would you stand with us? We're going to start by singing out together. We're going to worship loud together. That's why we're here this weekend. We came to sing and worship, to listen to God's Word. So let's sing loud together. Cause you 
because of Jesus that our story is not done yet. I'm so grateful for that. You can go ahead and take a seat right there. My name is Sean Jensen and I get the privilege of serving as your new lead pastor and it's been such a joy already. And I know you're like, oh, we get that. We see you on Saturday, but when are you gonna be here, right? Uh, we'll get to that later, but we're so glad that you're here. There might be some new people in here. Can we let them feel welcome by giving them a round of applause? We're so glad you made it. Thank you for joining us. We know that this might be a little new to you and we want to get to know you a little bit better and that might be difficult because we don't know anything about you. So there is actually a card right in the seat back in front of you. It's our connection card, it says next steps. If you want to take that out, fill out some information and take it to the info center in the lobby, it's a great way where we can get connected and we can get you a gift. If you don't want to do that, but you want to do it digitally, you can text the word next to 309-777-0677. But here's the coolest thing. If you do one of those two things, we are actually going to make a donation to one of our local ministry partners just for you being here today because we love to be a generous church. And so thank you for doing that. And maybe you're here and you also brought your children into this environment, which we're just glad that you made church a priority. If you're a family, thank you for getting your kids to church. It's such a priority. And at any time, if any of your kids get restless, I got three daughters and I know in environments like this, they can get restless and they need attention, all right? Sometimes I need attention in rooms like this. But if you need to meet their needs or maybe they need to burn off some energy, if you go out these double doors and take a left, there's a space where you can still engage with this service while you're engaging with your child or whatever they need. They would love to have that environment open for you. And we just love having these opportunities for you today. And as we go into a moment of giving, because we believe in giving generously here, I just wanna let you know that last night I was talking to some of our youth leaders and they told me that this week they had the most junior hires they have ever had in the history of Vail this week at Vail Youth. That's amazing. They've been smashing cars and eating smash burgers and doing laser tag and they did all of this when I was on vacation. So I got to do none of it. But because of your generosity, we get to do things like that. And the most important thing is they are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're seeing them being baptized and saved. So thank you for your generosity. If you would like to partner with us in giving, there's a few ways you can do that. If you're making a cash or check donation, there's drop boxes on your way out by these doors or in the lobby. You can go to veil.church or website to do that. Or you can also get the app. You can text the word veil to 77977. They're all safe. They're all secure. We love to give online because it helps us, you know, not forget. We like to be generous uh, through the app as well. And so if you don't have the app, you can get that at the app store. If you do, go ahead and get that out because we are going to lean in. We're going to hear a great message here in a moment. But before we do, check out the screens. We have some veil news for you.
Hey Vail Church, my name is Haley and I serve with the worship team here at Vail. We're glad you decided to make church a part of your weekend. We are excited to invite you on an incredible journey that will allow you to walk in the footsteps of two of Christianity's most influential figures, Paul and John. This land and cruise tour, taking place from October 1st to October 12th, 2024, promises to be a spiritual and educational experience like no other. During this remarkable journey, we will explore a series of significant biblical and historical sites, deepening our understanding of early Christianity and its profound impact on the world. We believe that this journey will not only deepen your faith, but also provide a greater appreciation for the growth of early Christianity and its profound influence on the world. To learn more about the trip, we invite you to attend our informational meetings on Sunday, September 17th at 12.30 p.m. These meetings will provide you with detailed information about the itinerary, costs, and how to reserve your spot on this once-in-a-lifetime adventure. Students, get ready. Thrive Conference 2023 is just around the corner. This is your save the date. Thrive will be happening on November 10th and 11th. We are offering an early bird registration discounted price of $149 beginning September 25th through October 22nd. The regular registration price is $179, so make sure to grab your discount as soon as those are available. At Thrive, we're bringing together students from grades 6 through 12 for an unforgettable experience that will leave you feeling renewed and empowered. Stay tuned for more updates and mark your calendars. Thrive Conference 2023 is going to be epic. Now, let's get ready for today's message. Vale family, how y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Good to see you, good to see you. Good to, good to be back. I feel like family at this point. And so uh, if you don't know me, my name is Matt Reagan. And I'm excited about your new guy. I'm just still getting to know him. We're grabbing lunch tomorrow. It's gonna be great. So, uh, but I've heard a lot of uh, folks and uh, just excited. I, I think I've told you this before. I think that I think Vale's best years are ahead of you. And so I'm excited. So we're gonna dive in. Um, I know that this is a series about people's questions. So I've got a couple things. I'm gonna open up some scripture. We're gonna dive into, I think, a question. One of the top questions as a pastor that I probably hear uh, time and time and time and time and time again that people ask, and uh, I'm excited. Y'all good? Y'all ready? All right. Okay, let's do this. So uh, Matthew 6 is where we're going to start, and this is uh, Jesus' disciples asked him how to pray. Interestingly enough, if you're new, true story. He could They could have asked him a lot of things, but the one thing that is recorded that, that they wanted to know was how to pray. And in this prayer, he taught him, and it's kind of like, I think it's like his thesis statement of what's on his heart and who he is, and this is how it goes. Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10 says this, says this then is how you should pray. Our father, we're going to talk about a, a good dad. I know not everybody's had a good dad. I actually didn't growing up. My dad has since come to Christ. But um, Jesus' primary way that he talked about God was as a father. That was new, just for the record. That was new, and Jesus, Jesus wanted to make sure that was true. So he just says, our father, who's in heaven, he's not like any other dad, hallowed or holy is your name. Holy simply means there's nobody like you. There's like nobody, not even close to who you are. So he says, uh, our father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, Meaning, um, here, put it like this, um, the kingdom is what happens when God's in the room. Does that make sense? Like when, when God's kingdom comes, the way he reigns, the way he rules, the way he talks, his tone, the fact that everybody gets protected, everybody gets loved. I, I've, been in, I've been in a million settings where it's like Jesus walks in the room. When, when, when the king walks in the room, everything changes. And so he says, listen, I want your kingdom to come. I know who you are and I know what you bring. I want your kingdom to come and I want your, what's that word right there? I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this one word right here is what we're going to talk about today, and it's this really interesting, true story. A few questions I get more as a pastor than, hey, Pastor Matt, I got a question for you. Hey, Matt, 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 I got this question. I got this big, I got this big thing. What do you think I should do right now? What, is, what do you think is, how would I ever figure out God's will? Do I go left? Do I go right? 
do I go to this college? Do I not go to this college? So what I did is I, I literally, um, I think the question that we're, we're gonna walk through today, and I think that if, if you knew what God's will for you today was, wouldn't that be great? Who feels like they struggle sometimes knowing what God's will is? Any parent, if you didn't raise your hand, you are lying, <laughs> right? Like, that's just part of the thing. I mean, I wish I knew, I wish I knew what to do. I wish I knew where to go. I wish I knew, do I take the job? Do I not take the job? So here's what I did. I started writing down just a bunch of questions that I get over years. And here's just some of them. This is fairly general. I think, it, you know, your age kind of determines the question, right? Um, but if you're in high school, a high school student, it starts, I've, I've heard this, should I date? Should I date? Should I date this person? Should I do, should I play this sport? A high school senior asks, where should I go to college? Should I go to college? Am I, what am I supposed to do? Tell me, what do you think God, how do I know what God wants me to do? A college freshman asks, um, where's the laundry machine? No, they take it home to mom. But they do say, what should my major be? They're like, man, there's a million options. I don't know what to do. What do you think God wants me to do if I just knew what God wanted me to do? A college sophomore asks, uh, so a college sophomore asks, what should my next major be, right? Because whatever they did the freshman year doesn't count. Like, it wasn't even close, right? And so um, then a college, a college senior starts asking questions like what? What kind of job? Am I gonna get a job? Am I gonna live in my parents' basement? And that's when parents' prayer lives just pick up right there. And then all of a sudden, they're like, well, who should I marry? Um, when should we have kids? Are we gonna be able to have kids? Uh, where are they supposed to go to school? Should my kids date, right? It starts going on a circle. Uh, should, you know, um, uh, where's my, where should they go to school? Do I have to pay for their school? That feels not fair. Um, is it time for me to shift careers? Anybody been through that? I mean, like, what, like, God, do I stay? Do I go? Do I shift? I mean, this feels like a big risk. Do I just go after it? Or, or what if this is just not a part of your plan? What do you want me to do with my aging parents? How much should I be sitting away for retirement? How, what role should I be playing in my kids' lives, in my grandkids' lives right now? And every question in between. And so this, this issue of God's will, whether, whether you say it like that or not, we all want to know, um, and, and we kind of put it like this, because I think our questions paint a picture. It feels like this. It feels like God has, I just drew this map. Are you a little impressed? A little bit? A little bit. You are a little bit. So it feels like, God has this map where he has like birth to death and this is what you were supposed to do. And he had this from the very beginning and if you just knew what was on the map, wouldn't it make life easier? Like you'd just be like, man, why wouldn't you just tell me that to begin with? Like, like if I could just, you know, on this map, you know, you're, you're just like, okay, you know, there's probably gonna be some hinge moments where, where I just need you, God, to tell me, do I go left or right, man? Like, just tell me, help me out. My kid is really struggling. What do I do? Help me understand where this map is gonna take us. And on this map, right, there's some destinations that we hope he has for us, right? Like, we, we hope he has the perfect marriage. Uh, all of you idealistic young people, perfect. It's gonna be perfect. Just think nothing else. It's gonna be perfect. Some people are like, you know, am I gonna have good kids or at least decently good kids, you know, there's some things that you want to avoid on this map, right? You want to avoid heartache. You want to avoid, uh, you know, some, some conflict in your life. You want to avoid heartache and loss. Then there's some destinations in life when if this is your concept and ideal of God and his decision-making for your life, then you're like, look, um, look, th this might have been what you had when I was younger, but I got to be honest, I think I zigged when I was supposed to zag. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like I'm off the map. I feel like I didn't choose the right person. I didn't pick the right job. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. And somehow, some way, you could walk in a room like this, and you go, whoa, 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 there's a map? <laughs> like, I didn't even, you didn't even know God might have these plans for you, and all of a sudden, you feel behind. You feel lost. How do I ever find where I'm going? How does this thing work? So... There's a reason that I want to talk about God's will because so many people are just like, God, I just wish, I, you, I just wish you'd tell me what to do and I, I just I feel lost and I feel like I don't understand your plans and if, even if I did, I just feel like I get it wrong all the time. So, so there's hope today because what I want to do today is I want to talk about how do you find God's will for your life? Like how do you just find it? 
Like, how do you find yourself in the middle of God's will? As a matter of fact, the word uh, will is the Greek word thelema. Thelema is the Greek word for it. The, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so the original language is just thelema. So when you see God's will, we have our own kind of idea and concept of what that means, right? When we think of will, we think of the last what? Last will and testament, right? And so it's something at the very end of somebody's life, like this is what needs to happen, um, but most of us, when we think of will, we think of Matt. But Thelema, and I just, I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of it. Thelema is a pretty big theme in the life of Jesus in, and really throughout the Gospels. God wants you to know what his will is. So I'm gonna read some scriptures over 64 times it's in scripture. Let me just, I'm just gonna pop through some, you know, all right? So if, if, if this is, feels like a lot, I promise we're gonna go somewhere here. But let me, let me just give you some scriptures. Matthew 6.10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's like the thesis of Jesus' prayer that he teaches his disciples. We already read that one. Next one. My food said Jesus. And this is after he's um, talking to the Samaritan woman. He's really exhausted. And they went to go get food and they came back and they were ready to give him food. And he's like, no, actually, I'm, I'm good. And they're like, what are you talking about? And he's like, my food said Jesus is to do the, what? To do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Next scripture is this, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus says it like this in seven, uh, Matthew 7, 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, talking about the end, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. That's a big statement. He's talking about at the very end, it's like everybody's gonna be like, it's, it's the day of days and we're gonna stand before him and he's gonna start saying, okay, only the person who does the will of my father is gonna walk into the promise that he's made for us. And so you keep going, Luke 12, 47, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 17 says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. He says, listen, um, if you've never talked about it, if you've never thought about it, I just want you to think about it. I, want you, I don't want you to be unaware of what God's will is because it's so important to understand for us to get you, for us to get where we're going. So um, Paul says we really need to dig in and figure this out. John, one of Jesus' closest friends, says this. It says, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. That's a big statement. He goes on to say a little bit later, First John 5 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything, talking about prayer, that literally you can ask anything, according to his will, and he hears us. So I don't know if you were picking up what I was picking up, but his will is tied to the eternal kingdom. His will is tied to answered prayers. His, t his, his will is such a mission-critical part of knowing him and walking with him. So my question is, if it's a map that I can't see and I can't ever really know, and it's that important, why does God make it so complicated? Do you ever feel like, God, just stop making it so complicated? Why is your will, like, why, why is it that I, I can't understand really what you want me to do? I don't know if you want me to go left or right. You tell me to pray for stuff, but when I pray for stuff, I don't know if you're really gonna answer. I don't know if it's on your will to do. Literally, you, this feels, the, the more you get into it, sometimes the more confusing it can be. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna cut through the, the clouds a little bit, and I just, I just wanna say, surely, Surely God had, if his will was such a big part of what he wanted for us, then surely, surely, it's more accessible than we think, right? So here's what I wanna do. I wanna, I wanna uh, kind of center around philema. Philema, if you take the word apart and you kind of dissect it, and I won't, I won't be too nerdy with you, but philema, literally, if you, just, if you just put it simple, if you just put it clearly, the best way to describe philema, philema is literally like it's kind of two parts of a Greek word, and it's like basically like the seat of the heart. So think of it like this. When we think of will, we think of map. When we think of will, we think of like this thing that we have to do. But really, the word philema in the Greek, it doesn't really mean that. As a matter of fact, if you read through Greek society at the time, it was something that was like something that was like burning on someone's heart. So it's kind of like this. If if, um, if, if the last will of testament, the reason that they write the last will, like this is what needs to happen, why? Because this is what was on the heart of the person when they passed. Does that make sense? 
So literally the thalema is, is literally, the reason they came up with that sound is because the word thalema sounds like the beating of the heart. So I just wanna put it like this. Um, the best way to understand thalema is not this. I just wanna reframe it a little bit and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take us on a little bit of a journey. But what if God's thalema isn't a map? What if God's will is his heart? So, look, I don't know, how many of you know, understand what's coming five years from now? And your kids, your life, or anything? Nobody. Like, if, if you ask me, I get people ask this, me all this time, hey, Matt, what do you think about, what do you think I should? I'm like, I, I don't know. Ask me about in the next five years, I can't tell you. Ask me about what God's heart for you is. I'm pretty confident I know. I mean, if I ask you what the five-year plan was, you'd be a little shaded. But if I said, but what, what does God think about you? And some of you, this is new, but anybody that's discovered anything, what's, what's his heart for you? Well, his heart is to never leave you, never forsake you. Those are promises. His heart is that he won't abandon you, that he wants to walk with you, that he's, he loved you so much that he went great lengths to sacrifice to you so that you could be a, so you could have a relationship with him. His heart for you is that you would never be alone. His heart for you is that you'd be a part of a family. His heart for you would be that no matter what's happened in your life, that by the grace of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus, that you would be washed, that you'd be clean. Clean. His heart for the, for the hopeless, his heart for the disenfranchised, his heart for the lonely. Does anybody have questions about God's heart for the lonely? No. So what's interesting, what's interesting to me is that we spend so much time, and I'm gonna unpack this a little bit, trying to figure out his map, but what if, what if he really wanted us to to wrap our minds and our hearts in our, in, our, in our thinking around his heart. I think I submit his heart is what matters most. When you know God's heart, when we put it like this, everything changes. So let me, let me back it up a little bit and then we'll, then we'll keep moving, okay? So when you know God's heart, when you know God's heart, um, here's what I would submit, you can obey. So when you can know God's heart, you can obey. So right now, I'm, I'm gonna boil this down a little bit. So if God's will is really God's heart, and if, and if we could just know God's heart, and if we could just do God's heart, all of those promises that I just gave you would come true. Literally everything would happen. So when you know God's heart, you can obey God's heart. So if you could know it and you could do it. So let me put it like this. So I don't know a lot about being God. I've never been one. I have been a dad, okay? So I have five kids. Can I, can I give a little picture of, uh, I think I gave, sent you the, the, yeah, these are my kids. I'm sorry they're shirtless. It's the only one we took. So if anybody's, uh, yeah, I'm sure you all go to beaches. So, um, so I'm, I'm gonna, you can just keep that up there for a little bit. I'm just gonna walk you through how a father who is, really what God would choose to be for you. Um, when it comes to knowing his will and doing his will, I want us to rethink how we think of how he makes decisions and how now you can make decisions. It'll make sense in a little bit. So let me put it like this. So my oldest son, so when it comes to obedience, when it comes to having a will, having a heart for someone, I can tell you my heart for my oldest. So my oldest is about six foot four, um, and he is really smart. Smart people in the room, where are you at? Oldest, oldest, you're not gonna say you're smart. Um, oldest in the room, where are you at? Oldest people in your family, where are you at? All right, all right, all right, okay. Um, the oldest are tend to be what? A little bossier. No, no, I'm just saying, a uh, little bit in charge. Um, this guy is really smart. He really, he is. He's, he's been a book reader. He used to just read a stack of books. When I look at my oldest, I see his wiring, just all the things that are unique in him that God's made him for. He's, he's literally, he's so thoughtful. He's so articulate. He reads. He's smart. He's intelligent. He's so much smarter than me. It, it, it really bugs me. Um, and... I see what God could do with his life. I see what that, like he has a confidence as an oldest that I don't understand. I'm, I'm a youngest. Youngest, where you at in the, fam in the room? Yeah, you're the party. It's okay, we'll get to you. <laughs> but the oldest, he has like, I, I see his wiring. He's super smart. He's very confident. When he walks in the room, he doesn't, he's, he just knows who he is and he will just be who he's made to be. 
and he will just leverage, like he'll, he'll be thoughtful. Um, that's who he is. And I, his potential for the kingdom, I'm seeing it right now. It's just so, it's so fun to watch. My second, uh, any, any second ones in the room? I, knew you th- I know you think that we're gonna forget you, but we, we're not going to. We'd never forget that middle child. Um, but the second, my, my second is my, my athlete. How many of you, like a lot of your life was wrapped around sports? Anybody? Just a lot of your life watching, being a part of. So my old, this one, um, he's currently on scholarship at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky, he's an athlete. From the time he was this big, um, when he walked in a room, he was always the leader and he was always super athletic. And literally he, you know, when I, when I walked, watched him walk into a room, I, it was just so funny. He had so much energy. He always has a plan. He knows where things are going. He's very disciplined. And that's just, that's just kind of who he is. He's the kind of guy that we, we've had a Bible study at our house for a long time. And, um, and the reason that we have so many, we, we'd have like 50, 60 boys come to our house every Friday morning. And really the reason 50, 60 boys came to the house is because Sam invited them. And when Sam invites people, people come. Some of you are just like that. Some of you, 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 have, you don't know why, but from birth you've been given this wiring of just a leadership that doesn't make sense. And when you walk in the room, usually the room changes. That's my Sam. My third one is Levi. Uh, Levi, he looks sneaky, doesn't he? Does he look a little sneaky? He is sneaky. He's the only one to sucker punch in my family. So I probably shouldn't be sharing that. Um, Levi is my feeler. Any, any feelers? Feelers? So I, I put it like this. Like, like he literally, he has deep questions. He loves to feel. Um, you know, when, when people walk up to Levi and they're like, how you doing? He's like, good. How's your soul? And they're like, Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not ready for that, man. Like in the middle of a worship service, like, you know, he's, he's the one that he's like, you know, he's got tears coming down his eyes and he's up and he opens his eyes and everybody's just standing around. He's like, what is wrong with you? Why, why are you terrible people? Like Levi is a feeler. And when I look at him, I'm just being honest. I see his wiring. Man, I see this potential, right? Like I see who he could be. Like as a father, I believe in the man that he's gonna be and that who he's gonna become and all the things that could come from this, this, this person that God's made that, he, that just, just step into who you're made to be. My, uh, right here, clear favorite, right? <laughs> One daughter, clear favorite, like no question, right? The boys know it, they're fine with it now. Or at least that's what the counselor says. It's fine, guys. <laughs> so, you know, my daughter, I love her. I call her the, you know, we call her the general because she's, she's soft and girly, but like some of you women, she's got a little something under the hood, you know what I'm saying? And she knows how to tell people where we're going and what we're doing, and she also has this really big heart. Um, I remember uh, when she was little, she was about this big, and, and we were downtown Indianapolis doing something and uh, some ministry thing, and all day, she got really overwhelmed by homelessness. If your kids run into this, and she just, she didn't know where to put it, and she was like, she was like, do you have money? And she just wanted to give all my money away. So I was like, let's just do this, right? So I give her money, and she's walking up to homeless people, and she's talking to them. Literally, she's like six years old, and she's walking around, and she's giving people money. Well, she ran me out of money so fast, guys. Like, I was so broke, and I just, I hadn't pulled out any money out, and I was like, you know, we'll do this again, but she asked me that night, she's like, do you have any more money? I was like, I don't, baby, and I was like, maybe tomorrow afternoon we can, we can get some money. So she goes into her room, and she starts writing in her journal. I'm like, I don't know what she's doing, but she's in there, and she's writing on her journal, and then uh, the next morning, we get out, and we start walking around, and she, she we, each homeless person, she rips off a page, and she walks over and talks to him for a minute and gives him a page, and then she does, she goes, and I, I'm looking at her, and I'm like, Sarah, what is she doing? What, my wife, and I'm like, what, are you, what is she doing? And I'm like, baby, baby, what are you, what are you doing? And she's like, like, duh, like, dad, if we don't have money, they at least need to know that God loves them. She had written them notes about how God loved them and was for, that's why she's my favorite, everybody. <laughs> it's not even close, right? But when I look at her, so keep this in mind, when I look at her, I see her wiring. I see her potential. I get it. Why? Because I'm a dad. Now go to the, the last one. Now, you know, he's the fifth one. Oh, I'm not supposed to touch it. I'm the worst. They'll get it. Sorry. Um, that fifth one's total surprise. Any surprises? Any of you surprises? Don't point. That's rude. Okay. Uh, and so he's my fifth kid. And, and like a lot of you youngest, I'm just gonna be honest. When you walk in the room, the room lights up. You're always fun. He's fun. 
He's, he's like, there's not a room. He, he doesn't have bad days. I shared this when we were praying up earlier. Like, he just wakes up and the world is alive. He loves it. Like, he just loves it. And I see his wiring. He's so people-centric. If there's not a million people around, he's like, why are there not people? I'm like, there's 50. He's like, there could be more. Like, he just loves people, loves energy. Now, um, being a father doesn't mean I just understand their wiring and I understand what they could be. I also understand what? What could get in the way of them using the wiring that God's given them to do the thing he's made them for and to cripple them in ways that as a father, I would never want that for my kids, right? I know that my oldest, I know that while he's intellectually smart and witty and bold, and he is, I just... I also know he can use his intelligence as a weapon. He's, some of you understand that. He's quick to understand complex things, like smarter than me, really is smarter. But he is, he's sometimes slow to see the value of people and love in people. He's quick to the right conclusion. It's harder for him sometimes to repent and say that he's wrong. He leans towards skepticism because he's so smart, sometimes he thinks he's smarter than God. And so as a father, I have to be in his ear, like just saying, hey, listen, man, you can't just think, you gotta love. Like trust your dad. I know what's in you. I know the challenges. I know what you're made for. You have to have compassion, son. You have to see people, son. Stop being a skeptic, son. It doesn't mean don't think it through, but I'm just telling you, don't weaponize, don't become arrogant. Um, Intelligence isn't your only pursuit. Stop being judgmental. You don't have to be in charge, son. You need to learn how to follow. Imagine, just imagine, if he never learned those lessons in his life. Imagine this guy, I I love him, love him. That's my boy. Imagine if he spent time in my house and he never understood how to obey, never understood how to trust, never understand, understood how to like live this life packed with like kingdom potential, but he was always locked up in pride and intellect, always being right. I know my Sam. Love this boy. It's my boy. But I'm just telling you, I know the leader he's gonna be, but I also know that there are a lot of competing voices in his life, right? Right? Telling him that his identity is his success, that if you just work hard, if you just be a great athlete. So as his dad, I'm, I literally, I'm in, I'm in his ear all the time, and I'm just, as his dad, I'm just speaking into his word, my heart for my son, saying, son, be careful, man. Success is loving people, not performing for them. Son, be careful. Success is having a good heart. Leadership is not how many people follow you. It's when they get where you've taken them. Where are they, son? Is it about you or is it about them? Be careful. Don't waste your leadership from God on your own success. Don't do it, son. My third son. I love him. It's my boy. And I'm just always, you know, he's my feeler. He's my creative. He's my culture shaper. But like a lot of you in the room, sometimes his feelings get in the way of truth, right? And I have to be speaking into his heart. What? Am I trying to get him go left and right and try to dictate all the decisions that he's making and where he needs to spend every day? No, what I'm doing is I'm speaking into his soul as a father because I understand his wiring and I understand his potential and I understand the things that could get in the way of that. And so I'm speaking into him saying, son, listen, you need to trust me, Levi, Life is not about your feelings right now, dude. And you have to trust me. You have to, you have to lean in. You're gonna have to sometimes put those emotions in neutral. I know God's gonna use you, but you have to have a foundation, Ava, in the way that she sees people. And I just love her. I, I, I tell her all the time, the compassion you carry, girl, and that big heart. But girl, your big heart that it wants to be used for the kingdom can also be a big target for the enemy. And sometimes that big heart gets attacked by, by friends that are, so I didn't know this until I had a daughter. Girls are crazy. Did anybody know this? I didn't know this. That was new to me. Like the boys, they're like, I hate you. They fight, they play basketball in like an hour. And you're like, this is easy. 
But these relationships with girls is just tough, and her heart is, is fragile. And I gotta tell you, she's got this leadership engine in her, but because she's a woman, this world is gonna tell her a lot of things she can't do that, just being honest, I don't want her to buy into. So I'm always saying, Ava, look, girl, you gotta guard your heart. Be careful on social media, girl. Don't react to your friend that way. I know how she just treated you. I know what she said about you, girl. Girl, don't let that boy dictate where beauty comes from in the way that you see yourself. Man, girl, seeing people the way Jesus sees people, that's your superpower, girl. And I'm just telling you, as her dad, I am 100% clear of her wiring, 100% clear in her potential. And I would do anything if she would just trust me so that she could step into what I, like what the father's heart is for her. My youngest, like some of you, I think people are gonna be drawn to him already, like the North Star. Like he, we went to all these graduation parties. Luke is in like 47 senior pictures with kids. <laughs> I'm not even making that up. And I'm just telling you, like, he just lights up every room, and you're fun, and you're energetic, and you're he's charismatic, again, like a lot of you. But how long before I have to whisper in his ear, son, your gifting to be charismatic is not just about you. Like, like what happens if he's 45 years old, and he's still throwing the best parties, but nobody ever really knows him? So... I just sit there and I go, man, this group right here, I don't know a lot about being a God, about being God. But ask me what my heart is, what I've spent the last 20 years, 21 if you count all the prayers before that oldest one was born, just with my heart for who they are and what they were gonna do and looking at their wiring and seeing their potential and making those warnings. That's the kind of stuff when now I understand as a father the way the father looks at you and says, hey, hey, um, so, so God, here's what I really wanna know. Do you want me to go left or do you want me to go right? Do you want me to buy the house? Do you want me to not buy the house? Do you want me to do this thing? Do you wanna do this thing? I'm just telling you as a father, you know what my answer to that is? Man, I care about your heart. I care about who you're becoming. And I'm just telling you, if you would just trust me, you would see why you're wired the way that you are. You would start to step into some of the potential you are made for. And if you would listen to my warnings, you would walk in my will, which is actually my heart in ways you never dreamed of. I think that's why Jesus said to his disciples, John 14, if you love me, you'll obey me. I understand that as a father. I think that's why Matthew 28, 18 says this, um, you know, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he says the second thing, that this big command, he says, and teach them how to obey my commandments. Why? Because he has a heart for every single person that's gonna come to him and he knows your wiring, he knows your potential, he knows what you're gonna come up against that's gonna try to keep you out of what it is that he has for you. And he wants you to obey, which is just trust. That's his will for you. He wants you to trust him. Because here's the thing, when you know God's heart, not only, not only, can you obey, but when you know God's heart, you can say yes. Well, Matt, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the thing. When you start to trust his heart, then decisions start coming. I remember a few years ago, it's been, a, it's, been a, uh, it's, been, it's been some years. So my wife and I were like, do we move this house? I think we've been here like six years. We could move. Anybody moved? Like, move, we move a lot because my wife... I don't know what's wrong with her, but I love her. And I just go, whatever you want, baby. So I remember six years in, we were at this house and we were praying about, should we move? We love our neighbors, but it just feels like it's time and there's kids and there's schools. And we were kind of locked up, just being honest in the conversation. So finally, like, we were just like one day, we were like, God, we don't know what your will is, but we're just gonna put the sign in the yard. We've been trying to lead some of our neighbors to Christ. We were apparently terrible at it because like no one had come. And, and, and we were like, you know, it was, it was like they didn't even like us. So we put the sign in the yard and all of a sudden uh, we put the sign in the yard and uh, we're out at the court, we're on this big court and, and uh, this neighbor uh, that was two doors down that used to wave to us occasionally, they had a baby, but they had a wave, but the wave was it. Like we didn't have a relationship. 
But the sign goes in the yard, and the neighbor comes down. His name is Chris. His wife's name is Holly. And he comes down, and he's like, he's like, sits down next to me in my in my driveway, and he's like, "So, you guys are moving?" And I'm like, "Yeah, you know." And I try to talk to unbelievers. I don't try to be. I just try to talk to them the way I talk normal. And I'm like, "Yeah, we we're kind of praying about it." And he didn't even blink. And he's like, "Cool." Uh, why are you leaving? And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know. I just, we just kind of felt like it was time. And he's like, that, that's really hard for me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> why is that hard? And, he, and he, go, he goes, man, I don't know. I guess, I guess Holly and I just always thought we were gonna be friends with you guys. And, and you know, I just, I, we just always saw it. I'm like, bro, I've been here like five years. <laughs> Where you been, bro? And he's like, man, we just, we just watch you with your kids and we just this. I'm just sitting here going, uh, oh, 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 okay, well, we're going. I don't know what to say right now. And he's like, would you come to our birthday party? We got a birthday party for our daughter this weekend. Would you come? And I'm like, yes, we will. And I go inside. I'm like, I just had the weirdest conversation. <laughs> it was so weird, babe. She's like, Chris and Holly? And I'm like, Chris and Holly. I'm like, I don't know what that means. So we, so we, we, we go to the party, right? Like walk into the house and we're like expecting to be there with a whole bunch of people because it's a party and we're just the neighbors that they one time waved and we're putting in the sign and we walk in. Here's who's at the party. The aunts, the uncles, the parents, and us. <laughs> and they say to introduce us, hey, mom, dad, aunts, uncles, these are our neighbors we've been telling you about. And we're like, what have we been saying about us? <laughs> So we're sitting in there, and we have this birthday party. My wife and I are looking at each other like, this is so weird. <laughs> we leave the house. We start walking down the street. We're like, and, and, and my wife was like, uh, she, she's smarter. Um, she said, do you think that maybe we put that sign in the yard so that God could open that door, and we're not supposed to leave, but we're right where we're supposed to be? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm so confused. Ever been there? You know what I'm saying? But can I give you some anchors for when you get to decisions like this? Do you think God cares which house we live in? I mean, he does. But he doesn't. He wants our yes. He wants our yes. Yes, I'll see. Yes, I'll notice. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll love, I'll care. I'll step out of my thing and I'll step into your thing. Yes, I just wanna do what you're doing. So we're, I'm like, I don't know. We picked up the yard sign, put it in the garage. One year later, we baptized Chris and Holly. Two years later, he became an ordained pastor at our staff. I sat next to him last night at our football game because our families are basically like one family, which is kind of weird because he's trying to get his son to date my daughter. But anyways, <laughs> I'm like, easy. <sighs> he wants our yes. So many times we're like, man, what about this college or what this job or what's this? And I, I just, he's a dad who knows your wiring who understands your potential, who knows what you're up against, and he wants your yes. What's, what's his will? What's his heart? It's you. For you to be unlocked. For you to say yes. Can you imagine a life of saying yes? I say to people all the time, I, I spend time with young people all the time, and they're like, man, I want the five-year plan. I'm like, here's the thing. I would rather, like, here's the thing. If I could coach you on your planning, like a, a master plan for your life for five years, or teach you how to say yes to Jesus for the next 30 days, which would I spend my time doing? Because I know. If you'll figure out that God has a heart for you, and you start to figure out how to say yes to him every single day, your five years will look so different than what you think your five years are gonna look like. They're not even comparable. He wants your yes. He wants your yes. 100% he just wants your yes. So when you know the Father's heart, you can obey him. I, I, I believe that. You just gotta trust him. 
He doesn't just have the wisdom to change your situation. He has the power. He, he wants to speak with his voice into you. He, ha, he has the ability to allow your chains to drop if you'll, just, if you'll just trust him. What he can do and what he can keep you from. And don't you wish somebody had come back in some certain points of your life and warned you about certain things? Don't you wish somebody, that somebody would have had the courage to step in and say, hey, that relationship's gonna hurt you. And this is gonna happen, but here's the thing. A, the, a father's not here, he's, he's here. When you know his father's heart, you can obey him. When you know the father's heart, you can start saying yes. My prayer, honestly, the number one thing that I was hoping that anybody would get here today would be that you would just start saying yes. You'd stop like praying, like sitting around going, okay, God, left or right, this house, that house, this job, this job. Those decisions get easier, super easy. When you start saying, hey, God, what can I say yes to with you today? Can, somebody, can I bless somebody? Can I, can I love somebody? Can I encourage somebody? Can I, can I speak in? Can I lean into the plans that you have for me today? Can I, can I turn something off? Some of you right now, you have some challenges like, like my kids the greatest thing that you could do today to step into his heart for you is to trust that what he has been warning you about, some of you are getting ready to make a bad decision today. And you want his heart on the house of the house. And he's like, I care about you. I want this. If you would trust me with this, if you would obey, if you would repent, if you would just decide, you know, I'm gonna stop settling, and we move into your heart for me and to just, and I just wanna do what you want. I wanna say yes to you. Then I think ultimately, then when you know God's heart, uh, you can worship. You can just worship. You can just say, when you, st when you start understanding that it's not about decisions, it's about what he wants for you, wants to lock, unlock in you. When you start recognizing that when you say yes to him, that he just, he just joins you and he meets you and it's powerful and it's beautiful. When you start diving in and just start talking to him because you just wanna know him, this crazy thing happens. When you start worshiping, but it's never about the lights or the stuff or the people, you just drive your... It's like driving your truck down the road and you're like, man, God, I can't believe you do this. And it just feels like the way that you treat my kids and the, and the way that you've redeemed me, like I was such a bum and I was making such bad decisions and I had no clue what I was doing as a parent. But here's the thing, as for me, this is what Joshua did really well, as for me and my house, God, we're just gonna trust you. We're just gonna try to obey you. We can't even do that all the time, right? We wanna obey you. We're gonna look for opportunities, not to, like, not to just get our stuff done, but we're gonna look for opportunities to just say yes to you. And when you start doing that, you just, something happens where you stop having to go after the feels and try to get, you just, I always say, worship is your wow. Worship, you just start going, wow, God, man, you're so good. When you know his, when you know his heart, um, this takes care of itself. My prayer as you go after his heart. Let me pray for you. Dear only Father God, I pray for anyone here tonight that is just needing to see your heart, needing to see you, that you're a good dad. And when it comes to the will, to your will and to the plans and the things that you have for them, God, that there is nothing like just leaning in and just saying, I trust you. Leaning in and saying, God, whatever you want me to say, like, just help me say yes to you because it leads us into worship. And so, Father, I, I pray that you would help us as we obey, as we say yes, meet us in our worship. We pray that in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, we show some appreciation for Pastor Matt. You know, we have a lot of exciting things going on at Vail. One of the most exciting things oh, we do every single man. week Thanks. is we help people go on their next steps. Every single person has a next step here in this room. This week you got to celebrate as a bunch of junior highs. We said this already. The most junior highs we've ever had in the building. We're taking next steps together. And we get to celebrate that and we get to be a part of it. We love being a part of that. And the seat back in front of you, there's a red card that says, my next step. And you can fill that out. 
You can write down information and hand that in the information center. We'd love to partner with you. If you're watching online, you can text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. And we'd love to partner with you on that next step. But here's the other thing I'll do. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're gonna pray again just in a second. There might be some of you in this room that your next step is saying yes to God for the first time. When Pastor Matt was speaking and you recognize, I do want everything that God's heart can provide in my life and I wanna say yes to him in my life. But to do that, I need to say yes for the first time. It's real simple. In the book of Romans, it says, if you believe in your heart that God sent Jesus, his son to earth to die as a sacrifice on your behalf, if you believe that and then you believe that he raised him to new life again, that in that moment, you're saved. God, by his goodness and his grace, he saves you. So this one, don't want to look around the room. Everybody's, everybody's heads down, everyone's eyes are closed. If you want to make that decision for the first time today, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Just look eyes at me. I want to pray for you in just a moment. Will you raise your hand? If you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time, you want everything his heart can provide you. Yeah, I see your hand over there. Anybody else? We're gonna pray together. God, I thank you for my friends in this room. I thank you for those watching online. I thank you for those that raised their hand today. Those who are watching online and they also want to say yes to you for the first time. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to guide them, to be a part of their life, to give them the direction they need and to save them today. God, for those who are too afraid to raise their hand, maybe they were nervous, but they also want to make the decision to pray for them as well. You send the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them for the rest of their life. God, we love you and we thank you. And everybody said, amen, amen. Would you stand with us? As we close our worship, celebrating and singing and worshiping together.
Can we just thank Matt Reagan for coming out again and just the time he spent? I just told him it was so awesome to hear him driving down to serve Vail in this season. Before you head out, um, we're just going to take this moment, kind of keep this environment. If you or anyone you know needs prayer for anything, our prayer team is going to be down front. We believe in the power of prayer, so we'd love to come beside you and pray for you. If you want to take communion today, we're actually going to have communion stations down here too if you would like to partake at any moment today. Um, we're so glad that you came out. So we're just going to keep this environment in this room for those as you head out today. Don't head out too fast. I'd love to say hi to you. Uh, we will see you next week. I will actually be delivering the word next week to you guys. So I can't wait to be doing that. Thank you for your patience. We're going to be talking about what the Bible says about anger. And we're going to have a great time. So go out there. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. <laughs>